Welcome back to part two of our video series about product lifecycle assessments. This video is the final video in the series, and it explores the last two phases of the LCA, the reporting and critical review phases. We take these two phases together because there are fewer technical considerations than we found in the executive phases, and so they're a bit quicker to discuss. But also, the reporting and review phases share several other considerations between them, and it makes sense to examine them together for the purposes of this series. We'll take them one at a time, and as always, our discussion here will reflect both of the ISO 14040 and 14044 standards documents as they pertain to each of the phases. Let's start with the reporting phase and talk about what makes a good report. A solid reporting strategy is integral for any LCA, and it should be developed in tandem with the study. An effective report will address each of the different phases of the LCA along the way. It will include the results and conclusions of the study, and address all of the data, methods, assumptions, and limitations inherent in the LCA study. It should be formatted adequately so that it's easy to read and understand by anyone in the intended audience. Now, depending who the audience actually is, and depending on the type of report that you generate, you'll be required to include certain things within this phase. These requirements change and expand depending on whether the report is prepared by a third party and whether the report will be used in comparative assertions released to the public. Regardless of the case, ISO 14044 lists requirements that demand full transparency with respect to value choices, rationales, and expert judgments utilized in your study. So let's pause a second. Let's break it down and start with the most general considerations and broaden our scope as necessary. We have some general requirements that apply to any type of LCA report that you might produce, so we'll start with those. First, let's explore that issue of transparency a bit deeper. Any LCA results and conclusions should be completely and accurately reported to the intended audience. Take extra care to eliminate bias in your reporting by whatever means are available to you. You should also be transparent when detailing your data, your methods, your assumptions, and your limitations. These should be presented in sufficient detail so that any reader can appreciate the complexities and the trade-offs contained in your LCA study. Here are some questions you can ask yourself when examining the transparency of your report. Have you made any modifications to the initial scope through iterative processes? What were your justifications for doing so? What is your system boundary? What types of inputs and outputs move across it as elementary flows? What are the associated decision criteria? How have you described your unit processes? How did you make any decisions you might have made about allocation? What does your data look like? What decisions did you make about handling individual data or groups of data? What are your data quality requirements? And finally, what are your impact categories and category indicators? And how did you come to choose them? Ultimately, the report should allow the results and the interpretation to be used in a manner consistent with the goal of the study in the context of the scope. At this point, you can consider that a graphical presentation of your LCI and LCIA results may be useful. Be mindful, however, that this does invite implicit comparisons and conclusions to be drawn and different people may view the same visual data set in different ways, regardless of any context you may try to provide. Okay, very good. With that being said, those are the general requirements for an LCA report. Now let's change focus a bit and talk about third-party reports. Let's start with a definition and some context. A third-party report should be prepared whenever the LCA results will be communicated to any interested third party that is, a party other than the study commissioner or practitioner. This condition holds regardless of the form of communication that it takes. So if this is the case, you need to create a more detailed report of the study results. If you get to this point, the report now officially con constitutes a reference document, and it needs to be made readily available to any third party to whom the communication is made. An interesting thing to note at this point is that the study details may come from documentation that contains confidential info 
even if that info is not included in the third-party report. That's just something to keep in mind. A third-party report is more comprehensive than a general report, and it covers general aspects of the study as well as information from each of the LCA phases. Let's dive in and take a look at the breakdown one section at a time. And just to keep things flowing, I will list off the sub-elements briefly and I'll expand on them only if it's necessary. Feel free to pause the video here if I go too fast, but I will do my best to keep a reasonable pace. Also feel free to refer to the standards documents if you feel you need more explanation about any of these elements. Alright, here's the additional categories you should consider if you are carrying out a third-party report. First, the general aspects of the report. The LCA commissioner and or practitioner, and whether these folks are internal or external to your organization. The date of the report. And a statement that the study has been conducted according to the requirements of the ISO 14040 family. Secondly, the goal of the study. The reasons for carrying out the study. And the intended applications of the study target audience or audiences of the study, and an explicit statement as to whether or not the study intends to support comparative assertions intended to be disclosed to the public. That's an important consideration, if you'll recall. Thirdly, the scope of the study. The function of your system, including both a statement of performance characteristics and a list of any additional functions omitted in your comparisons. Your functional unit, including its formal definition, its consistency with the goal and scope, and the results of its performance measurement. Your system boundary, including any omissions and assumptions, and a quantification of your inputs and outputs with respect to both energy and material. Your cutoff criteria for initial inclusion of inputs and outputs, including their formal definition, the effect of selection on your study results, and any mass, energy, or environmental cutoff information. Fourth, the LCI phase. Include your data collection procedures, as well as a qualitative and or quantitative description of your unit processes. Include your calculation procedures. Also, your procedure and results for validating your data including any data quality assessments and how you handled any incomplete or missing data. Any sensitivity analyses you performed for refining the system boundary. Any and all allocation principles and procedures, including their documentation and justification and the methods by which you attempted to apply them uniformly. Finally, the sources of any published literature that you may have used. Fifth, the LCIA phase. Now obviously this isn't an issue if you've performed an LCI study rather than a full LCA study, but let's assume that you have performed the LCIA phase. First up, list all of your LCIA procedures, calculations, and the results of the study. Discuss the relationships of the LCIA results relative to the LCA's goal and scope, as well as any limitations associated with them. You'll also want to discuss the relationship of the LCIA results to the LCI results and how one leads to the other. List your impact categories and category indicators, including a rationale for their selection and a reference to their sources. Include the descriptions of all characterization models, characterization factors, and methods employed, including any references you used and all of the assumptions or limitations associated with them. Include the descriptions of all of the value choices used in relation to your impact categories, characterization models, characterization factors, normalization, grouping, and weighting. Include references where you need to, and add a section where you talk about your justification for their use as well as their influence on the results, conclusions, and recommendations. Finally, you need to include a statement that the LCIA results are relative expressions and cannot directly predict impacts or risks. There are also some additional things you might need to include in the report that only apply to specific tools that you may have decided to use. For example, if you created any custom LCIA categories, indicators, or models, you'll need to describe them and justify their use as well. 
If you used any weighting or grouping or data aggregation, you'll need to explain why. If you use normalization or any of the other optional LCIA elements, you'll need to include the data as it exists before and after any of these operations. I would encourage you to refer to the standards documents at this point, especially if you end up with a piece of information that you're not sure how to report. Don't discard this data just because you can't see a good way to make it fit into the big picture. Take the time to determine where you can include it to ensure that you are upholding the principles of completeness and transparency inherent in the LCA. Okay, we're almost done. The sixth category of the third-party report has to do with the interpretation phase. You'll want to include the results, of course. Also list any assumptions and limitations associated with the interpretation of the results, whether related to the methodology or of the data. Include a data quality assessment that follows from your interpretation. As well, provide full transparency in terms of value choices, rationale, and expert judgments at this phase of the study. Finally, the critical review if it's applicable to you. You'll want to include the name and affiliation of the reviewers, as well as the critical review reports, and any responses to recommendations that might arise. This process might seem fairly ponderous and maybe a bit overkill, but please remember, we're trying to encapsulate all of the significant findings of the study in a format that is accessible and easy to digest. It's worth taking the time at this stage to ensure that all of the work you've put into the study is presented in a way that's easy to understand for those trying to access it. Now, we can even go one step further in our reporting and look at additional reporting requirements that you add when there are comparative assertions intended for public disclosure. I won't go into too much detail for this point because it won't apply to everyone watching this video, but you should be aware that there are a host of other requirements that come with such LCAs. Essentially, you will be responsible for further analysis of your justifications and more thorough assessments of the precision and completeness of your data. Descriptions of processes may need to be uh, expanded or augmented, and additional statements may need to be included as to whether or not your models or factors are recognized on an international basis. If you have incorporated particular value choices into your study, especially with respect to the optional LCIA element of grouping, there are even, even more requirements that you'll need to include. Honestly, I would strongly recommend you refer to the standards documents if your study contains comparative assertions intended for public consumption. There are simply too many requirements to list here, and you'll want to make sure that each of the elements that you may have opted to include or omit are adequately represented. All right, now let's move on to the critical review phase. It's helpful to consider what a review is and what a review is not. Critical review is a process to verify whether an LCA has met the requirements for methodology, data interpretation, and reporting. It might be used to facilitate understanding and enhance the credibility of an LCA, for example by involving interested parties. Essentially, however, we want to ensure that the study is consistent with the principles of an LCA, as set out in the ISO 14040 standards document. We want to make sure it's transparent and technically valid and that the data used are appropriate and reasonable with respect to the goal of the study. So what isn't a critical review? Critical review is not a way to verify or validate the goals that you've chosen for your LCA. It is also not a method to validate the ways in which your LCA results will be used. Now, there are a few different ways to carry out a critical review of your LCA study. But before we list them, it's worth taking a moment to revisit comparative assertions. You may have LCA results that you use to support comparative assertions, and we know by, that, by this point that this raises special concerns and makes this critical review phase a necessity rather than just a good idea. Keep in mind, however, that the presence of, of a review having been conducted should never imply endorsement of any of these comparative assertions based on the LCA study. What this means is, 
You should strive to keep the process of review separate from the conclusions that you've drawn from the study itself. We've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating at this point. All right then, how can we carry out a critical review? There are three main processes that you can consider. In the general case, you will have defined the type and scope of the review while you were defining the scope of the LCA itself. In this case, you should identify why the critical review is being undertaken, what's being covered, and in what level of detail. Also, who needs to be involved in the process? Confidentiality agreements revolving, uh, involving the content of the LCA, they should be struck as needed. At this general level, the review should ensure sufficiency of several LCIA elements. These include your classifications, your characterizations, and any elements of normalization, grouping, or weighting. Remember as well that these should all have been documented in a way that enabled the interpretation phase of the LCA to be carried out effectively. Now, you may have contracted a critical review that was conducted by an internal or external expert. This does not change much with the format of the review, except that the expert should be familiar with the requirements of LCA. This is, of course, in addition to having the appropriate technical or scientific expertise in their field to oversee and understand the results of the study in the first place. The review statement and any comments from the practitioner and any response to recommendations made by the reviewer should all be added to the LCA report in this case. And finally, you may have structured your critical review such that it was overseen or conducted by a panel of interested parties. In this case, an external independent expert should be selected to act as a chairperson of the review panel and they can in turn select other independent qualified reviewers. The panel may also include other interested parties like government agencies or NGOs or representatives from affected industries and even your own competitors. It all depends on the goal and scope of the study as is often the case. When it comes to reporting on the LCIA, you'll want to produce your findings as though you're conducting a review performed by an expert. This means you should consider the opinions of reviewers in those scientific disciplines relevant to the important impact categories of the study, in addition to other expertise and interests, of course. Now, if the results of your study are intended for disclosure to the public, this sort of critical review with a panel of interested parties, as we've described, is set as a hard requirement. This is intended to decrease the likelihood of misunderstanding or negative effects on external interested parties. And that is the end of the video, and indeed, the end of our video series on product lifecycle assessments. If you've managed to watch this whole series through, then congratulations! You should now have the basic tools that you need to perform your own product LCA according to the ISO 14040 family of standards. I hope you found this series helpful and useful, and I hope you'll manage to find a way to use it to make our planet a little greener and a little safer, while also improving your processes and bolstering your organization's bottom line. I'm Jamie Friend Ocumbo with EnviroPass. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please like and subscribe to catch all of the latest from EnviroPass, and as always, thanks for watching. Thank you.